Good morning, everyone. I'm Michelle Miller, and we're in the CBS This Morning Green Room with the sisters of Sandra Bland. In July of 2015, Sandra Bland was arrested after a minor traffic violation in Prairie View, Texas. Three days later, the 28-year-old was found hanging in a jail cell. Her death was ruled a suicide, but questions surrounding the circumstances and disturbing video of her arrest sparked allegations of a racially motivated murder and nationwide protest. A new HBO documentary, Say Her Name, The Life and Death of Sandra Bland, examines Bland's activism and her family's battle for answers about her time in custody. We're joined now by Bland's sisters, Shante Needham and Sharon Cooper. We thank you both for being here with us. Thank you for having us. When this took place back in 2015, I think what was so shocking was to see a woman literally being dragged out of a car. There have been lots of attention. What was taking place with um, African-American men and, and the traffic stops. But to see a woman uh, treated in this way for some people was really just so disturbing. People don't know who Sandra Bland was. And I want you to explain to me, she had everything going for her at this particular point in her life. She had gotten a new job. She was excited about this. Mm -hmm. And then she stopped mm -hmm. for giving a turn. Mm -hmm. Correct. Take us from there. Um, I think uh, I think you, you raised a really good point. I think that we have shined a light so um, traditionally on black men and boys and what happens to them and traffic stops. And what I think Sandra's story did was it amplified um, the issue of police brutality in terms of the interaction between law enforcement and those in the black community. I think that what you see in Sandy's story, to your point, she had her whole life ahead of, ahead of her, was very involved and engaged in her life. And the lack of a law enforcement official to de-escalate a situation and really stand by their oath to protect and serve can cause a seismic shift in one's life to the point where it becomes fatal. I know this was a woman who many people say should never have gone to jail. Absolutely. For a traffic stop. Um, take us through what exactly happened. Here she was, she had made uh, a, a turn, uh, not a turn. She had ref she had failed to signal mm -hmm. uh, to change lanes. But what does the documentary tell us that we don't know about what took place? I think what the documentary takes you through is what transpired within that three day period, and quite frankly, our interest in trying to piece together what happened because we weren't there. We weren't there, viewers weren't there. It was her, the jailers, and also to the police officer who actually delivered her to the jail, right? And so what you'll see there is that there are, why, why we have those questions is that what we were initially told at the time that we had conversations. What with were you told? What we were told was that when you come to Texas, you'll be able to definitively see that she contributed to her own death. You'll be able to see that this is the reason why we believe that she committed suicide. There will be evidentiary proof of that, to which there was none. So to that end, the, the film takes you through the, the questions that we have, the lingering questions that we have. But what it also does, too, is that it humanizes someone who, beyond the headlines, takes you into who she was as a person, takes you into her life as a daughter, as a sister, as an aunt, as a friend, as a sorority sister, to many who love and cared about her. And we hear it first person through Sandy Speaks. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the the use of, of, of this form of expression is mm -hmm. just, tell us more about that, Shad. I think she was just fed up with all of the social injustices that were going on just around the world, period. Mm -hmm. And so she decided one day that she would use her voice to speak on it. Um, she was an activist. Yeah. yeah. And she really felt committed to... And passionate. To, to bringing, like, some social understanding between, mm -hmm. you know, race relations yes. mm -hmm. into Absolutely. the forefront. She wasn't a racist, <laughs> like... I think people have it misconstrued. Mm -hmm. She wanted to unite everyone because she, everyone needed to be on one accord, period. And that's all she wanted. And also too, I think the video stem, um, the first one for my two sons, which are, they were young, 
African-American boys at the time. And with so much going on around with black men, I think she wanted to focus on them because as she said in her video, the young people are forgotten at some point. And she just wanted to focus and bring those young people's thoughts to the forefront. This is a documentary which doesn't just give you voice, the family voice. It gives a voice to uh, the DA, it gives a voice mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. several other people in law enforcement. Talk about why the filmmakers uh, seem to draw a pretty straight, narrow line mm -hmm. down the middle and on their quest to tell the story. When we talk about the need for conversation and community building, right, that is what we see going on in these situations where police encounters are turning fatal. There is a, an immense amount of miscommunication, misunderstanding. And so what we wanted to do was avoid that in, in sharing in this film what our experience was like. We think it's equally important to shine a light on what the Texas officials' experience was like and what they what they experienced. And so I think that it creates for a more balanced narrative, if you will. I think what it does is it, it seeks to answer a lot of the questions that people had, seeks to take viewers into the mines um, and, and into the jail and into the courtroom, quite frankly, to see some of the conversations that were going on. I and mean, so I think that that was the intent with the filmmakers was to try to present a holistic view. Mm -hmm. It also gives the family, uh, because the family did receive a settlement um, from mm -hmm. um, the county, um, but more so there were some stipulations mm -hmm. with what you wanted to see happen within the police department. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Did, did you get what you asked for? What did you ask for and <laughs> did you get what you asked for? Um, so with regard to the settlement, right, my mom, the non-compensatory -comp piece mm -hmm. was what she was most, um, about. Passionate about, thank Adamant you. Adamant about, right. <laughs> right, so that hopefully um, no other family could possibly, would have to endure what we have. So it was so like de-escalation training. de-escalation training, which they kind of like slid through the crack and they have not done that. But they do have the wands where they have to scan the inmates and... That's the biggest thing. The biggest thing for us was um, de-escalation training. Mm -hmm. What what the Sandra Bland Act does do in its current state is there is a mental health component of it, which we do think is equally important. If you come into a state or federal facility, you are in their custodial care, and it's their responsibility to give you the appropriate care based off of the information that you provide to them at that time of intake, right? So there's that component of it, which is important to us. I think important. ultimately what we want to share with people is that legislation legislation is something that it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. And we learned that through this process and what we'll continue to do, not just on behalf of Sandy, but the many others who have been impacted by a tragedy such as this, is to really, really focus on the need for de-escalation training, unconscious and conscious bias, bias training to try to continue that conversation around closing that gap between law enforcement and people of color for, in for, the, their communities. For a lot of people, though, it was that you know, Brian and Cena, the trooper who pulled her over, mm -hmm. um, didn't pull a trigger in in many people's minds. That's why he didn't, like, mm -hmm. kill her outright. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in many scenes, you see, you know, you see the video of someone shooting mm -hmm. and killing someone that they pull over. Mm -hmm. This isn't what happened here. Mm -hmm. um, he is no longer with... Uh, law enforcement in Texas and, in fact, cannot any longer um, be a part of any form of law enforcement there. In Texas. In, in Texas. Yeah, but where, what do we know about him? We don't know much. And what I will tell you is this. You make a great point that while he didn't pull the trigger, he was one who was in a position of power. And the misuse of your power is equivalent to me to pulling a trigger. So we don't know where he is. He's virtually gone under the radar. Um, I would imagine um, his, whether or not he's having a tough time in life, um, as far as I'm concerned, is uh, not a concern to us at all. I think that there is an immense amount of accountability that you have to take for changing the course of someone's life, um, which he has not done to this day. And so I do know that the filmmakers sought him out to try to get his side of the story as well, to which they were not successful. Do you think as, as a community, as a nation, we, we're suffering from 
outrage fatigue? Yes, absolutely. I do. Absolutely. There is a level of numbness that transpires when you're seeing some of the same stories over and over again. We saw even this week that there are new families, unfortunately, who will be joining what we call this fraternity and sorority that no one should be a part of, which is, um, you know, this burgeoning social justice narrative around disparate treatment between law enforcement and people um, in black and brown communities. And what we're seeing a lot on our TV screen is what's happening within black communities. So what that turns into sometimes is that there may be a level of concern that people don't care or people aren't paying attention, but those in those marginalized communities who are being impacted, they're speaking up. The burden and the onus now is on those who are in positions of power, who sit in a level of privilege, either from a race, gender, or socioeconomic status, where this may not be impacting them, to really amplify their voice and utilize their platform to bring um, attention to these issues. Yeah, you really want them to see this documentary. Is there, last question, is there any uh, question that we don't answer? But I do want to say this, we need accountability. We really need accountability all across the globe. I think if the police start being held accountable for their actions, then the citizens and of the world will begin to start trusting law enforcement officials just a little bit. But if they continue on being slapped on the wrist, if I may say, I, I don't think we'll ever be able to get to a place of equality. Well, Shantae Needham, Sharon Cooper, we, we really appreciate you being here. And we, uh, we, we want to tell everyone that the name of this, this documentary is Say Her Name. And they say it, they say it loudly. Say Her Name, The Life and Death of Sandra Bland. Sandra Bland. Yes. Sandra <laughs> Bland. <laughs> it premieres Monday, December 3rd at 10 p.m. Eastern on HBO.